Six two, 275 pound junior from Avenel, New Jersey. They have a stretcher out there. They have a cart out there. Greg Shiano is out there. And players on both teams have taken a knee. My dream is to get back on my feet and walk again and inspire millions of people out there in this world. So don't take anything for granted and be the best person that you can be. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. You can best believe that I'll never get up and I will rise from this chair. And I'm going to be walking all over this all over this world, dancing, having a great time. And I just want to thank you all again for listening to me. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. As I sit back there again, I came to hear this video twice today. It's, it still uh, gives me goosebumps and takes me back to those moments of when that happened now, eight and a half years ago through this injury. But as I was telling the group before, and, you know, people think that my story started, you know, right after October 16th, you know, 2010. But you know, I had a journey before that and life lessons I have learned that got me to where I am today and that has helped me. It helped me overcome when I was going through the tough times back right after my injury. And I want to take you guys kind of back through those moments as I lead you to my story after my injury. But, you know, there's a quick few lessons I want to teach you guys that helped me out from when I was a kid. And it still sticks with me to this day. And it's crazy the little stories that we have when, when we were younger that you will never think it would stick with us. But it has stuck with me today. And the first one was commitment. Kind of funny story. I was just, I was playing pop it was during football season, and I, it was probably Monday, Tuesday, so I had football practice, but I was after school, I was in the park playing with my friends, and you know, I was I was the best one on the team. It was, I remember my mom came into the park and said, Eric, stop to go to football practice, and I yelled back to her, I'm not going to practice today, I'll show up on game day, and it didn't go over well for me. <laughs> my mom came into the park and grabbed me by my arm, and dragged me through the park and into the back of the car and threw me in there and told me if I ever thought to tell her that I'm only going to a game and not going to practice, I'll never play any sports again. And continued to flip out on me the entire way home about <laughs> commitment. And if I if I commit myself to something and I see the whole thing through, you don't go you don't go at it halfway into that nature. Still to this day that sticks with me, being ten years old, getting dragged out of the park and embarrassed in front of my friends and that's how I learned commitment at a very young age. And it's got me, it's got me to where I am today. And uh, just the way that, you know, my effort when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So that when I learned humility at a, when I got to high school, I was, a, I was a sophomore, just like you guys were. Which I, mean, I got to tell the group earlier too. I forgot my freshman year in high school. I got to play you guys, and you guys got the better, better of my team. You guys beat us my freshman year in high school back in 2004. Pretty cool to see what you guys do in the end zone and paint the helmets and all that. Way. That's that's some pride of you. I do respect it. But um, uh, back when I was a sophomore in a, in a high school, and I was the, everyone knew I was going to be playing Division One football. I had just got a scholarship offer from Rutgers, but already that year we always had to climb into this disgusting hole, like this sewer hole, to turn on and off the water for for uh, for the team and. Each year, the seniors always got to pick one person to do it every day before practice and after practice. Well, guess who the seniors picked that year? I won for one of the sophomores. Me, I was climbing in that hole every single day, and I'm telling you, this hole was disgusting. It was old Pepsi bottles, and I don't know what was crawling in there. You know, it was just, it was one of those holes you get in and you get right out when you, when you gotta do it. But every day, you know, I, I was the best on the team, but it didn't matter. I was in that hole early before practice, and after I was dead tired, all tired after practice, sitting there waiting for everybody to take their drink, and I had to break the holes down and things of that nature. So I learned that as a young age too, about humility. No matter how good you are, you're never above the team. No matter who you are as a person, you're never above another person. It's all about being humble and being humble, no matter if you're better at something than somebody. That doesn't mean anything. You have to have humility in your life and understand that. You're no better than another person just because you may be good at, you know, better at something than somebody. 
we still, we're all human beings and we all need to treat each other just like that, to each other as an equal. From there, I went to college and I learned all about resiliency because the game that I had loved and my whole life when I was from five years old until I got, I got hurt. You know, I thought I lost the love of that my freshman year in college because of all the different movements and things I was going around with my football position and where my life was going to go. You know, my freshman year, I got recruited as a linebacker to go to, to Rutgers. And then my first day at training camp, I got moved to the defensive tackle on the D-line, which I never played in my entire life. So, you know, getting destroyed during all training camp and practice. And then week two, one of our guys gets injured at the defensive end, and I get moved over there. Played there for a solid five weeks, and then um, our offense wasn't doing too well, so I moved over to the offensive side of the ball. In the middle of the season, I'm playing fullback there. It was awful. My coach, I was awful at fullback on the offensive side of the ball. I learned it. I was a defensive guy, but I was terrible on the offensive side when it came to fullback. So I played there for two games. I moved back to defensive end, and then back finally at the end of the year, back to nose guard. And this. It was a big world one for us. So we started off one and five. It wasn't, it wasn't fun. Football just wasn't fun for me my freshman year at all. And then just going through the adjustment of being, able, being a college student and going to classes and things of that nature. It just wasn't the dream that I thought it was. And I remember just going through all of that. And then at the end of the year, I'm like, do I really want to do this? Or do I just want to go to school? And I said, you know, the grind, the work, the degree, this has got me to where I am today. Like, how can I let that situation break me? And then from there, going to a tough trading uh, off season, you know, chopping down trees at four o'clock in the morning, and going to all these different sprints and things of that nature. And I realized once I got through all those, at the end of the day, I was saying, you know what, I got through this. You know, nothing. But what wasn't able to break me mentally, physically, anything. And it's talking about being resilient in life because we're going to go through things in life that we don't want to do, or things that are tough in life, or things that make us, you know, sometimes question it. But if you can get through it each and every time, mentally and physically, that's the resiliency that you that you build up and it helps you set up for those those times. Each and each time it gets easier because you're able to deal with that. And that that's what leads me all the way to October 16, 2010. You know, when this injury happened to me, those those three core values that I have in my life has helped me to where I am today and has helped me to be where I wanted to be, you know, where is you know where I am today and when I first got hurt in my beginning. So October 16, 2010, you know, running down the field on a kickoff to make a tackle. I just had the game at MetLife First Army, 17-17 in the fourth quarter, at five minutes left in the game, and I want to make a big play for my team. Running down the field, I was facing a double team, was able to get right through it, and it was a 30 yard head start at this guy, I was going to make a tackle, so I knew it was going to be a big collision. As I'm running down the field, I said to myself, how do I want to make this tackle? Do I want to use my head or do I want to use my shoulder? And everyone knows plays football, if you're going to tackle with your head, you must see what you hit. I said, you know what, I'm only going to use my head because it's going to be a collision. Let me use my shoulder. As I get closer to the guy, I don't know if you saw, but my teammate got down there about a half a second before I did, and he tripped the guy up. And when he tripped the guy up, I put my head down to make the tackle, thinking it was going to be with my shoulder. But the, body, the guy's body got twirled, twirled in the air, and as it twirled, his back went right into the crown of my head, and that's what caused the accident. From there, my, my head coach, I mean, my train, the trainers come running out, and they're like, Eric, is it your head or your neck? And I'm like, I can't breathe. And like, can you feel this? Can you feel that? And I was just like, I can't breathe. From there, they brought my head coach out, she, uh, Coach Yano, and he comes down and looks at me, he goes, E, you have to pray. And honestly, when he said that to me, I thought my life was over because I couldn't move. I can't breathe, and now my coach is telling me I have to pray, thinking this is it. You know, and at one point, I did close my eyes, and I said, God, take me in. It's over. And I was, you know, nothing, nothing happened to that guy, and I was still here, but I, I started panicking again. I opened my eyes, but at this point, they were putting a board under me, and they was lift me up and put me onto the car. As they went to put me up on the car, I caught in breath for a second, so I was like, okay, maybe I just knocked the wind at myself. I think it's going to be all right. Let me give a thumbs up to the crowd. Let me give, I want to give that thumbs up to the crowd to let everyone know I was going to be okay. I just felt like there was a thousand of pounds in the block like the morning and I blacked out. And I don't remember much until Wednesday, you know, this injury happened on Saturday. I do remember getting to the hospital, looking up and seeing a bunch of lights as I was getting carted down the hallway. But then I blacked out. 
I woke up and I was in a room with a bunch of doctors, but it sounded like that. I spoke in a different language. Blacked out. Woke up one more time, and now I was in a room by myself with just a bunch of monitors and sounds going off. And then I blacked out again. Wednesday came around. This is when, this is when I remember I woke up to on Wednesday. So I put a room full of a bunch of jerseys, helmets, posters, banners, all hung up around my room. People reaching out to me from all different colleges, all NFL teams around the world. It was amazing to see how decorated in my room was and how so many people were reaching out to me and incredible to see. And it was all about the positive energy. Everyone who came into my room out there, like my family members, my friends, everyone was so uplifted and motivated. And like, e, everything's gonna be fine, you're gonna be okay. It was good the doctors even were just uplifting at the time. And that's what I, I said to myself, wow, you know, this is everything is going to be fine. And I started seeing friends that I haven't seen since middle school and then high school. They were stopping by and kind of made me forget about everything that was going on with me. And I started talking with them. <laughs> and I was catching up with them because it hadn't been there for the years. So that made me kind of forget about everything that was going on with my life. It just took me in that moment, and I think I think about it now. It was all about the positive energy and the positive vibes that were in that room that day. And no, not that day, just that time period that got me over that, that toughest part of my life, you know, that first week and a half to three weeks. You know, and just that everyone I looked up was just so uplifting because you put the positive vibes into the room, and you see what positive energy just does for people. It starts to inspire the best out of you. It brings the best out of other people, makes you want to help people, makes you want to do so many things. If there's negative energy in the room, if there's people in there crying, complaining, or just, just, just all around making me feel bad about my situation, I don't know if I would be where I am today. But I didn't see any of that. And of course, later on, my friends had told me after they left the hospital, you know, they would be hysterically crying and things like that. But in the very beginning, all I needed was that positive energy. And honestly, that positive energy sparked a miracle. I wasn't supposed to be where I am at today. And, you know, to the grace of God and the hard work and the positive vibes, I am here today, which was truly amazing. So when you start being positive in your life and you just start automatically just thinking of positive things, watch where it takes you because that negative energy, believe me, it could just, it could bury you and you start thinking negative thoughts all the time. Bring your minds to positive things and be the opposite because everyone's minds always go to negative first. Negative, negative, negative. Bring it to the positive side, I'm telling you. When basic things happen in your life. But from there, as I was saying, you know, so many people were coming into my room and it's so positive, but little did I know what the doctors had told my mom that night I went to the surgery. And they were, there were two doctors that put my mom, my teammate, and his mom into the room. And they were very blunt with her and they said, Your son has fractured his C3, C4 vertebrae. He'll be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of his life. He'll never eat solid foods again. He'll never breathe on his own. He'll never walk again. And we're hoping that he's strong enough to make it through the surgery. So imagine you know, my mom, now after hearing that news, she's completely devastated. So that one doctor left to go get prepared for the surgery. Um, uh, and my teammate busted out the room and was yelling to me because he didn't want to hear that. But then the other doctor started talking to my mom and trying to give her all these different percentages, saying maybe it's not that bad, it might be a percentage of this percentage of that, but my mom wasn't trying to hear that at that time. So from there, what I, I kind of remember this and I kind of don't remember this. I think I want to see my mom before I went into surgery. And she said the first three words that I said to her were, I'll be back. And I don't know where I got it from if I was still had the adrenaline going from the game, if I was just thinking about the recovery. I don't know where my mind was at. But the first three words, like I said to her, were, I'll be back. And she said when I said that to her, from here on out, like, that's when she said that you can't be upset when, then, when you see him, you're going to be. How's it almost everything's gonna be great? And that's like I said, it sparked everything. From there, I get to um I get to, you know, meet meet the people but I just started to now have an adjustment period in my life where I went from not trusting anybody with these nurses to start to get used to everyone in my new life with these nurses and the doctors and things of that nature. And right as I started getting used to everyone, they broke the news to me that I was gonna be leaving Hackensack Hospital in a few days going over to Kessel uh, to another rehab center, which at first did not sit with me well because I, could, I went from being this big football player, being able to take care of myself to now having to rely on a lot of people and I, as I didn't trust everyone at first and I finally started getting used to that. But no, that then came November 3rd of 2010, then I was going to transfer over to um, Kessler. 
I get it all the time with getting into the ambulance that day. Well, waking up that day and waking up knowing that I was told it wasn't right, I wasn't ready yet. Because I fell asleep, I was still falling asleep on people in the conversation. Uh, my body just wasn't ready to exercise yet and get ready to go through just a rehab process. I just knew something wasn't right, but everyone was pumping me up like, E, we gotta get you out of here, we gotta get you a therapy, we gotta get you on your feet, and this and that. I said, let's go with it, you know, let's try it. He moved over to Kester, and um, I remember getting carted down in the hallway after I got out of the, um, in the ambulance. I had somebody squeezing the air into my into my uh, my trachea, like tracheotomy at the time. And talk about trying to have somebody's life in your hand and being completely nervous. Somebody was squeezing air into my into my lungs pretty much, and it was completely terrifying because I was on the machine. And I had to rely on somebody to squeeze air into me. So having somebody's life in your hands, I was. It was one of the scariest moments of my life and probably made me get, just get all nervous throughout the whole time. So I get into Kessler now, I got everybody looking at me in the hallway as I'm getting carted down there. And of course I don't know any of these people, so I'm getting more, even more nervous. I get into my room and they decided they wanted to bring everyone in there to meet me. So I guess you know give me a warm welcome. Probably wasn't the best idea, but they brought in the CEO of the place, administration, uh, doctors that were gonna be taking care of me, the nurses. I take care of him, the last guy that comes to this room when I was telling him earlier. This five foot six, 140 pounds you're making me. And he, with the accent and everything, he said, what's going on, Eddie? I'm going to be taking care of your mom. I'm going to be getting you dressed, getting you fed up in the morning, getting you showered, this and that. And I would look at him and I would say, I look over at my mom and I said, Mom, you got to get me out of here if there's going to be a guy taking care of me for the next five months or so. I was not like I say, the big football player, I was like 16, 275, so this tiny little man told me he's going to be getting me up and get me dressed and showered and all this other. No rule, no way possible, but his name was Humphrey. Humphrey did his job, and he did for the next five months. He taught my mom how to take care of everyone. He said that she became a family friend, but at the time I was completely terrified, so. Hopefully, this is finally leave your room and I finally calmed down a little bit. And Rutgers was actually playing that night, so I started to get excited again, which was weird because usually we play on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, but you know, we were playing on Wednesday night, so I was excited to see my team down in Tampa. Uh, around 7 8 o'clock, I had to pick out the uniforms on the line, out. And they were going back and forth, all game long, back and forth, back and forth. The fourth quarter comes, and all of a sudden, I'm laying in my bed and I start to get real anxious and real jittery. So I asked the aide that night that I was working, I was like, can you put my shoulders this way, pull it back that way. Can you put a pillow under my arm, take it out, put it under my leg, and it'll be back this way, put this pillow here. Every five minutes, I was like, Eric, you gotta calm down, you gotta calm down. I was just like, I can't get comfortable. I just can't get comfortable. From there, the Rockers went on to, to lose an arm that night by, by six, and you know, we, just, we just missed it at the end. And I remember saying, let me just go to bed and rest up and it's been a long day. I closed my eyes, I went to sleep, and about an hour and a half went by and I woke up. And I was on a stretcher. And I remember when I woke up on a stretcher, I opened my eyes, but my vision was completely blurred. Couldn't see anything. And I remember someone smacked me in my face. And then, like I said, it didn't sound like a male or a female, it sounded like a demon. Like, Eric, wake up. And I said, I said, hit me again. It was my mom, she smacked me right across my face again. And when I didn't, when I didn't recognize her, and she, she, got, she got nervous and ran out the room to the nurses and said, we gotta get him out of here now, he doesn't even know who I am. And come to find out, I had 105.5 degree fever, and I was 0.5 degrees away from frying my brain and becoming greater for the rest of my life if they did not figure out what was causing this fever, despite that, and my brain being at that temperature. So for now, so now and then, my mom has to call down to my coach and down in Tampa and tell him everything that's going on. And then he's now there, he told me months and months later, but when they laid, laid in the back in North New Jersey, you know, that night, they were scared to turn their phones off because they didn't know what type of news that they were going to if I had pulled through and made it through the night. So right away, my coach and I'd like to come over to the hospital. So, so I get, we'll go to St. Barnabas Hospital. And I kind of got a funny story. I was completely delirious, and this is what the fever did to me, but I remember being in there, the first two people I saw were my sister and my athletic director. 
And I woke up and I was like, hey, Nicole, how are you doing? And she goes, hey, you know, I'm doing good, how are you doing? And he gave us a little bit of a scare. And I said, yeah, I'm all good and everything, but are we going to IHOP? And my sister, and my sister looked like, I have no, we're not going to IHOP today. And I was like, why? I want some pancakes. And she was like, no, you Eric, you can't even eat pancakes. I like, didn't. And I got mad again. I was like, why can't we go to IHOP? I want the pancakes. Coming up first, I got frustrated. So I remember because and I went, you know what? Let me go for a walk to blow off the steam. I try to get up and go for a walk. I'm like, Nicole, get off of me. She goes, and Eric, I'm not on you. I'm like, Nicole, get off. I want to go for a walk. She goes, Eric, you can't go for a walk right now. And I just want to get so frustrated. I look up and my athletic director now is staring at me with his eyes bulging out of his head completely. Nervous, not knowing what to say or what to do. And I just got so frustrated. I threw my head back into the bed and I blacked out. So an hour went by. Finally, they found out I had some infections on me. They were able to give me some IV medicine and I was able to get my fever down. And uh, I woke up and now I'm in the room about 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock. And the story I'm about to tell you changed my life forever. But as I'm laying in the room, I look over and I see my mom and my sister. And they're leaning on each other in this little couch and knocked out. I look in front of me and my head coach is in my room. Knocked out sleep when it spilled a cup of coffee out of the and I didn't want to wake anybody up because I knew it was early in the morning, so I just started watching the sports center and you know, checking out my surroundings. As I'm watching the sports center, and all of a sudden I hear it starting to get real loud in the hallway. So I look out in the hallway, and all of a sudden you see this girl get rushed and on the stretcher, and then right behind her you see mom, dad, aunts, uncles, grandparents, what you know, the family. But right after that, a bunch of kids your age, 15, 16, 17 years old, all come in with concerned looks on their face. Finally, everyone uh, passes by through the hallway, and uh, my room was right outside the nurse's station, so once it got quiet in the hallway, I can only hear the nurses speaking, and come to find out that girl had a, a cancerous tumor on her brain and actually started to bleed out. So they were rushing her to do emergency surgery, and as I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, that's a terrible situation. Maybe another hour went by, so five minutes, six, six o'clock, whatever, six thirty in the morning. And everyone's still knocked out of my room, so all of a sudden it starts getting loud in the hallway again. And I look back out there, and this time when it was loud, it was real loud. And all of a sudden you see people hysterically crying, just walking right past my room, right past mom, dad, and aunts, uncles, and all the kids your age walking right past my room and starting to cry. Finally, it gets quiet again in the hallway, and I overhear the nurses speaking again, and come to find out that girl didn't make it to the night. And when I heard that right away, I was like, wow. Oh my God, this is my second chance. You know, I still got, I still got you know, air in my lungs. I'm still breathing. I'm still fighting. That girl's fight is over. She doesn't have another chance. You know, whatever I need to do, if I need to pray, if I need to work hard, if I need to rest, whatever it is, I'm going to do because this is, this is my second chance in life. And I'm not going to let my situation be, you know, be like a pity party for me. I, I have life. I can keep on going and see this. Those kids your age all gonna start to cry like that is an image that's gonna stick with me for the rest of my life. There's a definition I want to leave you guys with that I that was embedded in my head at workers. I mean, you say that you used to say it every day, and I still say it to this day now. It's a definition of success. And it's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. I'll say it one more time. It's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. If you know you gave it your all at whatever it was, if it was at football practice today, if it was with your homework, if it was helping your parents on the weekend, whatever it is, you know you gave it your all at that, you should be able to lay your head down on that pillow at night and say, you know what? I gave it my all. I did what I left it all out there. There was nothing else I could do. And you your own definition of success, you should be able to sleep at ease, knowing that you left it all on the table. And that's what it's about, because when you start doing that, wait till that light, when you get to that light at the end of the tunnel. It just shines that much more bright and amazing things to continue to happen in your life. And people see it with me too, because I always say, you know, with this injury, you know, I don't like being paralyzed, but people are like, what would you change? I'm like, things I've gotten to do, the people I've gotten to meet, and the places I've gotten to go, all the blessings in my life, I don't know if I can take those back now. I'm like, of course I do not want to be in this chair. I wish it could be up. But I don't know if I would change anything because of the 
the great things that have happened in my life and the blessings and I just said, this just comes from the attitude that you have for everything, the way the people view you, you and look at you. Because we, this is who I am. This is not how I put on a show. This is why I truly have a positive attitude and I look at life in a different way because I have an appreciation on you. If you guys can do that, watch what life will take you. Amazing things will happen. So thank you for letting me share my story with you guys a little bit. I love it. I'll up with some questions. So. I guess it was five months, and when I and I remember that that last day when I was leaving, Jermaine was in the hospital. So I never really got to say goodbye to him because you know he was going through chemo and stuff at the time. And then somebody had to be at, at the hospital for like three days, four days, five days, whatever it was. But um, I went over to uh, to move out to my aunt's house in Jackson. I took a two week break from therapy just to get my life just adjusted to being at home and just a new life at home. So I took a two week break. Then I came back up to Keston, which I was going to be in an outpatient gym now, with new therapists, new, new people, new everything, and a new part of the building, and it was just an amped up therapy now. So the first day I come in on a Friday to do my evaluation, I look over and there's a wheelchair section where people get fitted for their permanent chairs, and guess who was in the wheelchair section? It was Jermaine. So I rolled in there, I was like, hey, well, Jermaine, what's up, man? Like, what's going on? And he turned and looked at me with a blank stare, blank face, didn't know who I was. Like, we just spent five months together in this rehab, and he had no idea who I was. So I was like, wow, you know, obviously things are taking a turn for the worse. I mean, you know, the cancer is spreading, doesn't he you know, recognize me? So I went over to my therapist and did my evaluation for the day. Jermaine left a little bit before I did, so I'm like, you know what, I'll catch up with him on Monday, you know, maybe he'll recognize who I am on Monday. So I left, went home for the weekend, came back on Monday. When I got there on Monday, I rolled back over to the wheelchair clinic and I was like, hey, did Jermaine ever get fit for the, you know, his permanent chair? Did everything go all right? Like, yeah, he got fit for his permanent chair, but unfortunately he passed away on the weekend. And I remember when I heard that news, I was like, you know what? You will never hear me complain about anything in this world again. You know, this Jermaine would do anything just to be able to take care of himself. Meanwhile, I got millions of people wishing me well. Or, Want to help me out, want to do this, want to do that for me. And maybe, you know, have a newfound appreciation of life. And I said, in life, you do got to be appreciative for the things that we do have. Don't focus on the things that you don't have. And if it's something that you want, then you got to work your butt off together. There's no ways around it, you know. And people always love to complain about their situation or say, you know, I got this bad, I got that bad. That's, that's just to humans. That's what, you know, we complain about our situation. But no matter how bad our situation may be, no matter what, someone always has a worse than you. No matter what. No matter what's going on in your life, someone always has a worse than you. And it's crazy because I can sit there and say that I can't even shake your hand right now. I know people that are sitting at home bedridden. I have a friend, Ingrid, who unfortunately was not wearing a seatbelt when she got injured. We went through a windshield, pulled her head out of the windshield, and then when she went to get out the car, her first fracture her neck. She lives in a one bedroom apartment in Jersey City where the elevator is broken all the time. Can't even get out of the house with seven people living in that one bedroom apartment. You know, so I understand that no matter what, someone always has it worse than you, so you think that be a crucial to your life. And people ask me, like, how do you see some motivated driven? And I say, it's the random people that tell me I'm helping them now. You know, going through life with weather well, if it's I ran ten miles a day. Because I know you can't run our bridge your book today. Because you know, I, I did a book before with you and you inspired me and my family. Stuff like that knows I'm making a difference in life. Because in life, we're all going to face some type of adversity. Whether we're five years old or 65 years old, how you handle it ultimately is going to define you as, that per as a person. And that's why I try to tell people, try to help people get through certain situations. Especially you guys in, in high school and middle school. People love to bully people and put somebody down for a good laugh or make them feel good for that moment. And when you pick somebody up and help them get through something that they may be going through, it's such a much better feeling helping somebody go through something. Because in the life when you guys come here, you know, go to school, you don't know what someone's may be dealing with at home. When they get to school, that might be their time of release, their time of uh, when they feel like they can breathe and be around their peers and you know, just have fun with them. But when you have somebody trying to put you down all the time, and then you go home and you might be dealing with tough stuff at home. You know, it's not right. 
So try to pick somebody up and be there for that person and help them get through a situation because it's a much better feeling. And honestly, you'll see it. When you start doing that to people, because more positive things will start being around you, more people will want to be around you because you're letting off that type of energy that will help helping other people. Believe me, it's a great feeling. And that's kind of another thing that's funny too. When I got hurt, people thought that Rutgers automatically, they gave me my degree because, you know, they just thought, oh yeah, you got hurt, they ain't got handed his degree. I was like, shoot, I wish they gave me that thing. But I, I had to go back to some school to uh, take classes. Venus Skype, I started taking the classes that January of 2011, where I would Skype into the lecture hall from Kessler. And someone would take the notes from me, they'd email the notes over, and I would have to go on the, the software that they had on my computer called Dragon Natural Speaking. And you know, she could speak to your computer and you now get it to work. And let me tell you, when I had to do those five page papers, it's a lot easier to type out that five page paper than it was to try to talk to this Dragon Natural Speaker, but hey. That's what I had to do, and I was able to graduate with my degree in labor relations in 2014 for longer. So there's no excuses from any of you guys. If you guys got the dream and aspirations to go to school and further your education after high school, you guys could do it. If I could do it without writing my name on the paper, not able to, you guys could definitely get it done through that hard work and determination. And I was telling people earlier, everyone always puts everything out to us. You gotta set long term goals and continue to reach out for them. To see the strive from this, but you saw that video. My goal, like I said, is to go back to MetLife Stadium and lay back down on that 25 mile line and finish that last play. I can't tell you when that's going to happen. I can't. But I'm going to keep on working my butt off until I get to that day and it does happen. Even though everything, I know it's not going to happen right this minute. I'm not going to get that instant gratification right now. But I'm going to keep on going through that process because it's all about the process. In life, we've got to fall in love with the process of things because. That's what ultimately we learn from that process, we grow from the process, and we become that person because of the process of getting to where we want to get to. The goals that we set, the dreams that we set aside for us. That's where it's, that's where it's all about the process of getting to that goal, the process of getting to that dream. It's where you learn the most about yourself. And there's a definition I want to leave you guys with that I, that was embedded in my head at Rutgers. But we say that, I used to say it every day, and I still say it to this day now. It's a definition of success. And it's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. I'll say it one more time. It's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. If you know you gave it your all that, whatever it was, if it was at football practice today, if it was with your homework, if it was helping your parents and all whatever it is, you know you gave it your all at that, you should be able to lay your head down on that pillow at night and say, you know what? I gave it my all. I did I left it all out there. There was nothing else I could do. And you your own definition of success, you should be able to sleep at ease, knowing that you left it all on the table. And that's what it's about, because when you start doing that, wait till that light, when you get to that light at the end of the tunnel, it just shines that much more bright. And amazing things to continue to happen in your life. And people see it with me too, because I always say, you know, with this injury, you know, I don't like being paralyzed, but people are like, what would you change? I'm like, the things I've got to do, the people I've got to meet, and the places I've got to go, all the blessings in my life, I don't know if I can take those back now. Like I said, of course, I do not want to be in this chair. I wish it could be up. But I don't know if I would change anything because of the, the great things that have happened in my life and the blessings that I just said. This just comes from the attitude that you have for it, everything, the way that people view you and look at you. Because we, this is who I am. This is another time I would put on a show. This is why I truly have a positive attitude when I look at life in a different way because I have my appreciation. And if you guys can do that, watch what life will take you. Amazing things will happen. So thank you for letting me share my story with you guys a little bit. I would love to open it up for some questions. So. I guess for five months, and when I, and I remember that, that last day when I was leaving, Jermaine was in the hospital. I never really got to say goodbye to him because, you know, he was one of the chemo and stuff at the time. And then somebody told me that I had a hospital for three days, four days, five days, whatever it was. But um, I went over to, uh, to move out to my aunt's house in Jackson. I took a two-week break from therapy just to get my life just adjusted to being at home and just a new life at home. So I took a two-week break. Then I came back up to Keston, which I was going to be in an outpatient gym now with new therapists, new, new people, new everything and a new part of the building, and it was just 
I amped up that right now. So the first day I come in on a Friday and do my evaluation, I look over and there's a wheelchair section where people get fitted for their permanent chairs and guess who's in the wheelchair section? There's Jermaine. So I rolled in there, I was like, hey, well, Jermaine, what's up, man? I'm like, what's going on? And he turned and looked at me with a blank stare, blank face, didn't know who I was. Like, we just spent five months together in this rehab, and he had no idea who I was. So I was like, wow, you know, obviously things are taking a turn for the worse. I mean, you know, the cancer is spreading, he doesn't even recognize me. So I went over to my therapist and did my evaluation for the day. Jermaine left a little bit before I did, so I'm like, you know what, I'll catch up with him on Monday, you know, maybe I'll recognize why I'm on Monday. So I left, went home for the weekend, came back on Monday. When I got there on Monday, I rolled back over to the wheelchair clinic, and I was like, hey, did you mean everybody fit for his, you know, his permanent chair? Did everything go all right? Like, yeah, he got fit for his permanent chair, but unfortunately he passed away on the weekend. And I remember when I heard that news, I was like, you know what? You will never hear me complain about anything in this world again. You know, this Jermaine would do anything just to be able to take care of himself. Meanwhile, I got millions of people wishing me well or wanting to help me out, wanting to do this, wanting to do that for me. And maybe, you know, have a newfound appreciation of life. And I said, in life, you do got to be appreciative for the things that we do have. Don't focus on the things that you don't have. And if it's something that you want, then you got to work your butt off together. There's no ways around it, you know. And People always love to complain about their situation or say, you know, I got this bad, I got that bad. That's, that's just to humans. That's what, you know, we complain about our situation. But no matter how bad our situation may be, no matter what, someone always has a worse than you. No matter what. No matter what's going on in your life, someone always has a worse than you. And it's crazy because I can sit here and say that I can't even shake your hand right now. I know people that are sitting at home bedridden. I have a friend, Ingrid, who Unfortunately, was not wearing a seatbelt when she got uh, injured. We went through a windshield, pulled her head out of the windshield, and then when she went to get out of the car, her first fracture her neck. She lives in a one-bedroom apartment in Jersey City where the elevator is broken all the time. Can't even get out of the house with seven people living in that one-bedroom apartment. You know, so I understand that no matter what, someone always has a worse so you keep going to be appreciative in life. And people ask me, like, how do you say some motivated and driven? And I say, it's the random people that tell me I'm helping them out, you know, going through life with whether if it's I ran 10 miles a day, because I know you can't run our bridge book today. Because you know, I, I did a book report on you and you inspired me and my family. Stuff like that knows I'm making a difference in life. Because in life, we're all gonna face some type of adversity. Whether we're five years old or sixty-five years old, how you handle it ultimately is gonna define you as that per as a person. And that's why I try to tell people. Try to help people get through certain situations, especially you guys in, in high school and middle school. People love to bully people and put somebody down for a good laugh or make them feel good for that moment. And when you pick somebody up and help them get through something that they may be going through, it's such a much better feeling helping somebody go through something. Because in life, when you guys come here, you know, go to school, you don't know what someone's maybe dealing with at home. When they get to school, that might be their time of release, their time of, ah. Uh, but they feel like they can breathe and be around their peers and just, you know, not just have fun with them. But when you have somebody trying to put you down all the time, and then you go home, you might be having dealing with stuff, tough stuff at home. You know, it's not right. So try to pick somebody up and be there for that person and help them get through a situation because it's a much better feeling. And honestly, you'll see it. When you start doing that to people, it's just more positive things will start being around you. More people will want to be around you because you're letting off that type of energy that or of helping other people. Believe me, it's a great feeling. And it's kind of another thing that's funny too. When I got hurt, people thought that Rutgers automatically, they gave me my degree because you know, they just thought, oh yeah, you got hurt, then you got handed his degree. I was like, shoot, I wish they gave me that paper. But I, I had to go back to some school, took, uh, taking classes. Venus Skype, I started taking classes that January 2011, where I was Skyping to the lecture hall from Kessler. And someone would take the notes from me, they'd email the notes over, and I would. I have to go on the, the software that they had on my computer called Dragon Natural Speaking. And you, know, you can speak to your computer and you now get it to work. And let me tell you, when I had to do those five page papers, it's a lot easier to type out that five page paper than it was to try to talk to this Dragon Natural Speaker. But hey, that's what I had to do. And I was able to graduate with my degree in labor relations in 2014 for Rutgers. So there's no excuses from any of you guys. If you guys got the dream and aspirations to go to school, for further education after high school, 
You guys could do it if I could do it. When I write my name on the paper, I'm able to. You guys could definitely get it done through that hard work and determination. And I was, I was telling people earlier, everyone always puts everything down to this gratification. You gotta set long term goals and continue to reach out for them. And she was striving for them. As you saw that video, my goal, like I said, is to go back to MetLife Stadium and lay back down on that 25 mile line and finish that last play. I can't tell you when that's going to happen. I can't. But I'm going to keep on working my butt off until I get to that day that it does happen. Even though everything, I know mean, it's not going to happen right this minute. I'm not going to get that instant gratification right now. But I'm going to keep on going through that process because it's all about the process. In life, we've got to fall in love with the process of things because that's what ultimately we learn from that process, we grow from the process, and we become that person because of the process of it to where we want to get to. The goals that we set, the dreams that we set aside for us. That's where it's, that's where it's all about the process of getting to that goal, the process of getting to that dream. It's where you learn the most about yourself. And this is a definition I want to leave you guys with that I that was embedded in my head at workers. But we say that I used to say it every day and I still say it to this day now. It's a definition of success. And it's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. I'll say it one more time. It's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. If you know you gave it your all at whatever it was, if it was at football practice today, if it was with your homework, if it was helping your parents on the weekend, whatever it is, you know you gave it your all at that, you should be able to lay your head down on that pillow at night and say, you know what, I gave it my all. I, did my, I left it all out there. There was nothing else I could do. And you your own definition of success, you should be able to sleep at ease knowing that you left it all on the table. And that's what it's about, because when you start doing that, Wait till that light. when you get to that light at the end of the tunnel, it just shines that much more bright. And amazing things to continue to happen in your life. And people see it with me too, because I always say, you know, with this injury, you know, I don't like being paralyzed, but people are like, what would you change? I'm like, the things I've gotten to do, the people I've gotten to meet, and the places I've gotten to go, all the blessings in my life, I don't know if I can take those back now. I'm like, of course I do not want to be in this chair. I wish it could be up. But I don't know if I would change anything because of the, the great things that have happened in my life and the blessings that I just said. This just comes from the attitude that you have for everything, the way that people view you and look at you. Because we, this is who I am. This is not how I put on a show. This is why I truly have a positive attitude and I look at life in a different way because I have my appreciation. And if you guys can do that, watch what life will take you. Amazing things will happen. So thank you for letting me share my story with you guys a little bit. I love it. I love it. I love it.